Awesome. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. Um, and then people can join as they're able. So I want to welcome everyone to another one of APSA's interactive sessions um, on the 2022-2023 academic year. We are pleased to host tonight's session with current physician scientist trainees to answer questions about the interview process for dual degree programs. Just a reminder that tonight's webinar is a part of the ongoing Supporting Applicants webinar series. We encourage all of you in attendance um, tonight to be on the lookout for registration for our next session. This is going to be on December 8th, and it'll be on gap years and post back programs. So I'd like to now have our wonderful panelists go around and introduce themselves and including their current institutions and their role. So um, to be efficient, I'll call you each by name, starting with Alan. All right. Um, so my name's Alan. I'm at the University of Rochester. I'm um, for my G4, so I've been in the program for six years now. Um, and my work on PhD is in biomedical engineering and my work is in computational and quantitative MRI. Very cool. Awesome. Alan. Thanks for joining us. Um, Kira, you can go next. Hi, I'm Kira. I'm currently at the University of Miami and I'm an M1. Great. And Luke. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining tonight. Uh, I'm Luke. I'm a first year MD PhD student at Johns Hopkins, and I'm interested in uh, biomedical engineering. So happy to answer any questions related to, to that area. Thank you, Luke and Nora. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nora. I'm an M1 at the University of Washington, and I'm interested in infectious diseases and host pathogen interactions, and also happy to answer any questions about that. Great, thank you all. Um, so thank you so much for being here. We're grateful that you took the time out of your day to come virtually and to meet um, to meet all of us and to provide your wisdom and pearls to folks thinking about a career as a physician scientist. Um, so my name is Monica. I'm gonna be the moderator for the evening. I am a first year MD PhD student at the University of Miami. Um, and the chat box as well, helping us moderate will be Ming Pham. And for those that might have to step away or miss a piece of it for just a moment, just a reminder that this will be recorded and will be on our YouTube channel and then we'll email it out afterwards as well. Um, so as the moderator, I will remind you to su please submit your questions to the Q&A box. Um, we have already received questions that were submitted during the registration process. And we'll have a team of co-moderators behind the scenes collecting these questions live. So you can submit them to the chat box and we'll go through and answer them. So I think that's all the announcements I have for that moment. Thank you again all for being here. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with our first question. Um, so I thought to kick things off, it'd be great, um, especially we have some folks that are M1s as panelists, as well as Alan kind of on the other end um, at the G end of this. So uh, I was curious just if we could start off what you all think is the best way to tell your story as to why you aspire to pursue an MD PhD program. So during the interview, um, how does one going about telling their story? Um, and Alan, do you want to start with you? Sure. Um, I, I hope the advice is useful and it's probably advice you'll hear a lot in different forms. Um, I, I think sincerity uh, is always helpful. Um, you know, all the shows, you can only be yourself. And I, I think more and more as I've interviewed people, as, as many of you will throughout the process, um, hopefully your universities let you after M1. Um, you can tell when someone is, you know, however you want to say it, speaking their truth, telling their story, um, and when they're not. And uh, personally, I prefer when someone is just being sincere and honest. Um, and yeah, I don't mean to diminish the experience at all, but, but it's not that hard. You know, everyone has been in your shoes before um, and been asked the same questions. So they're not expecting you to, to reinvent the wheel. Thank you, Alan. Um, look, do you have anything to add to that about um, best way to tell your story? Yeah, I think um, what Alan said is definitely true. You might think that um, your story may not be unique, but um, you'd be surprised actually if you're just speaking, you know, out of sincerity and, and telling the truth about what motivated you to go into this career path. I think if you speak to that honestly, um, you know, admissions committee members and interviewers really appreciate that. And I think in terms of, you know, telling a narrative, I think, you know, humans, generally speaking, we understand things in terms of narratives and stories. So the way I would um, approach, you know, explaining why you want to pursue an MD-PhD is, you know, first think about what is the initial spark that motivated you to 
explore this career path and then explain how you have been exploring it, you know, sort of what you've been doing in the present and then try to extrapolate and um, think longer term of what you hope to continue doing um, throughout your career and where you hope to see yourself down the line. I think sort of thinking in terms of past, present and future is helpful for sort of articulating that narrative. So that's what, you know, I would advise. That's good advice. I really like the the past, present, and future perspective you're bringing to it too, just because this is such a long process. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think I can really feel the sincerity radiating off of both of you. Um, Kira, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so to sort of speak to one of the things that Luke said, I think that something people are really worried about is trying to come across as like unique or different. Mm -hmm. um and something that was told to me like very early in the process is like you will not be unique like we are all going into the same career we likely have very similar reasons for going into it um and they do not expect you to have like some sort of wild story that got you to the place that you are in now so genuinely like just laying it out there and like saying what actually brought you there i think is way more important than trying to sort of like spin the one thing that you think is what is going to make you unique and really get you in. So I think that, yeah, I mean, I'm saying like very similar things to what the past two people have said, but don't get too bogged down by trying to stand out and instead just talk about who you are from a sincere place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Nora, I'd love to hear your perspective as well. Yeah, I completely agree with what everyone says about the importance of, you know, telling your story really sincerely. Um, I think something I'll add is, you know, at, by the time you get to the interview, you've, you've told your story in, in writing form through the primary and through the secondary. And so you've had some practice, like understanding how to tell it in a narrative way. And I think that, you know, taking some time to practice saying that out loud and sort of distilling what you've already written down into an interview format um, is really important. Um, and just, yeah, just very like, honestly explaining why, you know, you don't just want to do an MD, you don't just want to do a PhD, but how you've gotten to a place where you've decided that this career path is, um, is right for you. And then I think Luke's point about talking about your, your plans for the future um, is also really useful. Um, yeah, but approaching it with sincerity and the storytelling, I think, are, are definitely two things that I think about. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And um, especially since you touched on practicing and, and continue to have kind of be ready with your story to tell, um, we had a lot of questions about the best ways to prepare for um, MD PhD interviews. So Dora, I'd love to hear just a little bit about how you prepared, um, what, what approaches you took coming into it. Yeah, I think that there's a, like a fine balance between over-preparing and, and under-preparing. I think there's certain questions that you'll definitely get asked at any interview, um, like why MD, PhD is probably like the big one that stands out. Tell about a research project and your role in it. Um, also like separately, why MD, why MD, PhD? So I think, or why PhD? So I think having those ones at least like practiced, especially like the research one, um, you know, knowing what you're gonna say and how you're gonna tell that story is important, um, but definitely not like going so far as to have things scripted. Um, so I just practice with a bunch of different people. Um, so with friends from school, with family members who maybe didn't know as much about um, science and medicine, making sure that I was, being clear about research to people who were outside of that field. Um, also, my undergrad was really great in that they offered us mock interviews. Um, also, I did a mock interview with the PI of the lab I was working in. So just getting like pretty diverse, um, a diverse group of people to practice with, I think was mm -hmm. really helpful. Just saying, talking through your story a few times, it just gets more smooth every time you get more comfortable with it. Um, so that, yeah, that's my advice for, for how I prepared at least. I think that's wonderful advice, especially um, talking talking to a lot of people and talking to people out of your field about your research. Um, I know from my personal experience, it can be challenging to try to communicate what you're saying um, when you're so deep into your research. Um, and at least in my interview experiences, you're, you get a lot of folks that aren't in your field at all. Um, so they might, you know, they're scientifically literate, but you've got to really know your research well enough to be able to communicate it. So I think that's a great point is practicing with friends, practicing with family. Um, Alan, I'm curious on, on your end of things, kind of seeing the other side of interviewing um, 
And um, how, how did you prepare, if you can remember back to your M1 days? Yeah, um, so you'll see a recurring theme. Um, and I don't know if that's, I don't know, if there's some transition that starts to occur. But uh, and again, I will emphasize not to diminish the um, gravity or importance or stress that everyone is feeling as they lead up to this. Um, I don't think I necessarily did. And I don't think that's mm -hmm. arrogant as much as it was naivety and complacency, but like one, the two anecdotes I like to tell are, you know, my, our current, my current director, Carrie um, at UVAR said like, if you're getting an interview, 80% of you will be accepted somewhere the following year and it could be a made up statistic. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I think you should have a certain amount of confidence in yourself. And it's more of just seeing are you a person? They've made a lot of those things on paper. And half my interviews were like conversations about what I was currently reading. Um, mm -hmm. They just asked me like, what, or I don't know, maybe just because it's Rochester, I didn't get these everywhere, but you know, how my family would describe me. And you can't prepare for those things. Um, just have to, you know, you're, you're, I'm sure you've met new people in your life um, and you've gotten to know them and, and that's what you're doing here. So I think again, just be nimble, um, uh, be ready for anything and yeah. Um, relax. I think that would be the biggest thing to prepare is, um, yeah, you don't want to trip on yourself. So just, just stay relaxed and confident in yourself that you made it up to that point. I think that's really great advice, especially the, if you've gotten to the interview stage, feel confident. I, I think we should really all feel that. Um, I'm curious, looking to on the other side, since you've now seen students um, interview quite a bit, uh, can you tell when students are prepared? Is there anything that really stands out to you? I know you mentioned sincerity. Yeah, one thing not to be obnoxious and say I don't like it, but I'll ask a question and I can tell I'm getting a scripted answer because they're not mm -hmm. answering the question. They're like, no, 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 I have to like tell you my pre-prepared like research what I do. That's mm -hmm. like, that's great. But I, what if I'm asking a more nuanced question, you know, even something simple like what's the next experiment? And you could tell their, their head's exploding because that wasn't part of, it's not on their index card. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is from my understanding the way we're prepared and you know, we have our own little meetings about what what's you're allowed to ask and what you're not and what you know makes a good interview um you don't want to drill someone either um are those questions right it's early on and i think a lot of people's interest in careers change throughout the program throughout their life like you know might do wet lab might do more clinical research later but just thinking broadly you know what are questions you'd like to ask how do you think you'd like to answer them what are things you'd like to learn um and I think being prepared for those questions and, and you're not going to have all the answers that's you're going to do a PhD, but starting to think and being able to answer a little bit like, how would you design that next experiment that maybe you don't have funding for in your current lab, but maybe you don't have the resources. Um, but, but starting to think in that way and being ready to answer those things, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I really like your framing it um, because you're framing it much more as a conversation between you and the interviewer and much less like the interviewer is looking for one specific thing for me to say back to them. Um, so I, I really like your framing of that. And I think that can help ease the nerves in a lot of, for a lot of respects. Um, Luke, I guess as well, since, since the process was so recent for you, I'm curious to hear how you prepared for your interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In addition to what Nora and Alan said, um, I definitely agree with with everything. I also will add that I definitely um, prepared differently for my first interview compared to the latter ones. Um, for example, before the first one, it was sort of the great unknown, like what am I going to be asked during these interviews? And you know, I prepared a whole list of questions and made notes on all of them. And then, you know, as you go through the first few, you realize that there's a lot of common questions that are they're asked, like Nor like Nora Nora said, uh, you know, why MD PhD? Tell me about your research. Tell me about yourself. Those are all things you could expect to be um, asked in every single one. So you should have, you know, pretty tight answers to those and, you know, have them somewhat um, practiced but not rehearsed. And then I think um, as you do a few and you see uh, what they're like, you realize, like Alan said, they're really just conversations if they go well. So if you're approaching it as a conversation with, you know, someone who you're actually interested in talking to, I think ideally you should, you know, do a little bit of research on, them and their work beforehand. So you can have some informed and intelligent questions to ask them to, you know, sort of carry the conversation along. Um, so that, I think that's what, that's the shift I made as I, you know, progressed throughout my interviews was um, starting to actually um, do a little bit more background research on my interviewers and, you know, just being able to ask them uh, about their work. And then once I did that, they just felt like conversations from then on. And I think that's really what makes a good interview. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think to your point of, um, you know, maybe not feeling so prepared for the first one, Nora's point about if you have the chance to um, attend a mock interview is extremely helpful at your respective institution, um, mm -hmm. or just, just being able to practice talking with your PI. Um, and when you kind of, kind of, kind of shake some of the nerves off early on, I think that's a great point. Um, mm -hmm. Kira, I want to go last to you as well, just about uh, how you prepared for your interviews. Yeah, so I think that one thing to not discount in this whole process is how much self-reflection and how many types of the interview questions you will, you have already written about in your secondaries and like will be asked about. Um, I think that, you know, you sort of like collect all of these like lovely little like tidbits of your life into your secondaries. And it's like a nice way to um, sort of like prep yourself for interviews because it helps you just to remember like what experiences you've had and like the breadth of things you've done um so i think don't like discount the amount of work you've already put in just by prepping for your secondaries and doing your secondaries um the one thing i would add to what everyone else has said is that i would try practicing on zoom i think that there are like a mm -hmm. lot of little awkward things that can happen on Zoom um, that you aren't necessarily anticipating because in a normal conversation they don't really happen uh, and there can be like lags or people talking over each other um, in a way that feels like kind of unnatural. Um, so like Nora was saying, if you and a friend can just sort of get together and talk through those like big questions that you're expecting to get every time, um, it can be helpful in figuring out like what might go wrong on Zoom and then feeling okay with the fact that it will go wrong. Um, and another thing to remember is that everyone most of the time is on Zoom. So it's like very much a level playing field in that everyone is gonna have these little Zoom fumbles. So don't stress yourself out too much about that. And then the last thing I wanted to say is that you should prepare for like each school individually, which was something that I didn't really like think that much about beforehand. And now like looking back on it, I'm like, duh, of course. But I think it's really valuable to get a very good grip on the school. I know you did some of that work already for your secondaries, but when you've written, you know, 20 plus secondaries, it can be easy to sort of lose sight of why you were interested in that school in the first place. So revisiting your essays, revisiting their websites, and really trying to get a feel for the program before you start so that you can have a sincere answer to why do you want to join this program, I think is very useful. Absolutely. 100%. I especially like your, your point of revisiting your essays because um, depending on the interview style, a lot of them will be kind of open file and they'll have your essays in front of them and it might be something you haven't touched in a few months. So it's really good to, to look back through what you wrote and, and I like the idea of self-reflection, why you wrote about it. Um, I wanted to add as well, just the, I really like your point on making sure to be comfortable with Zoom since we're all now in a Zoom world. Um, I know speaking from, from my own personal experience, my mom lives in a different state. So I had her Zooming with me and asking me MMI questions so that I could make sure the Wi-Fi was okay, make sure the lighting was fine. Um, and I think those sort of things will really help you with nerves and make you feel a lot more comfortable going into it. Um, I'm going to take a break just for a second to remind everyone that please feel free to submit any extra questions you have within the Q&A box. Um, and if I get the chance to bring them up today, otherwise we also will have folks will be going around and answering questions within the chat box. So if anyone um, has a burning question, feel free to add it to the Q&A box. Um, I guess, so we did talk a little bit um, and Luke touched on um, how some schools might be giving you some background information on the um, on the persons that you'll be meeting with. And I guess I'm curious if we can maybe kind of demystify the process of interviews a little bit. Um, so, so school to school, it's highly varied and you'll have to be based on, on the school that you're at. Um, but I'm curious if maybe we'll start with Nora for the interviews that you went to, just kind of the general format, what it most frequently looked like, whether you were doing MD or PhD or both all together, um, or did you find that the process was really varied? Yeah, um, I found that the process was a little bit different at each school, but for the most part followed like somewhat similar pattern of having more like MD specific interviews. So sometimes whole days that were just med school interviews. So whether that was like an MMI, if that med school did that, or just, you know, talking to people in the in the med school admissions 
And then sometimes they would have a day that was like entirely PhD focused where you were just talking to um, a bunch of different PIs. A lot of schools before the interview would send you a form where you would fill out some um, labs that you were interested in that aligned with your research interests. And then you would end up talking to those people. Um, and then other schools would kind of match them, match you up themselves with people who they thought would align with your research interests. And sometimes they would be people who you actually didn't have that much in common with. Um, and that's fine too. Just, you know, you get to talk about science. It's maybe um, outside your field or outside their field. Um, but, and then there was also sometimes a third day or somehow, you know, in those two days of maybe like very MD, PhD specific interviews. So interviews with current MD, PhD students, interviews with the directors. Um, but I think that all the schools that I interviewed at pretty much fall into, fell into that format of having some MD specific interviews, some PhD specific interviews, and then some um, combination of them. And so preparing for those interviews and understanding the, the different purpose of what, what interview you're stepping into, um, mm -hmm. I think was like very valuable going in. So for like the PI interviews, you know, that's, you're just going to be pretty much talking about science. Maybe they'll ask you why you want to do an MD PhD, but for the most part, it's however long the interview is of just like chatting about science. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And then did you find, um, as far as speaking with students or speaking with uh, mostly admins or faculty, did you have kind of a mix? I know in my experience, they would set aside like scheduled time of the day where you could actually speak with current students. That would be a little more off the book. Um, and you could get a little more of a feel of a school that way. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess I forgot about that part too, is that they had a lot of informational stuff. Most schools scheduled throughout the day. So there would be like a Zoom that was a welcome with the directors and more like panel style Q and A's with current students that weren't necessarily like evaluating you in any way, but was more, I think, recruiting you and sort of telling you why you would want to go to that school. Cause I think the point that Alan made is getting to the interview stage, like they're very interested in you and they want to sell their school to you also. So a huge part of the interview days, aside from the one-on-one -on -one interviews is learning about the school, talking to current students and making sure that you're actually getting your questions answered because it is definitely a two-way street, which is something that was hard for me to think of when it feels like all the scrutiny is on you, but um, it's important to remember that you're also evaluating your fit with the school. Um, and so those, those other parts of the interview days were pretty useful for learning more about the program in the school. Absolutely. I think that's a great point and, and hopefully should help with the nerves somewhat is, is you are interviewing the school as much as they're interviewing you. Um, Luke, I'm curious you um, if you had any anything that really stood out as far as the interview process and kind of how it was structured for you across the schools that you interviewed at. I don't think I have too much to add. Uh, Nor co covered most of the basics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to have probably an interview with someone from the MD PhD admissions committee. You'll have an inter interview probably with someone from the MD admission side, and then you have all your faculty PI interviews where you just talk about science usually. Um, some schools will do student, student interviews. Um, I would say the majority did, um, but they're a little bit more relaxed than a, um, a faculty interview. Um, like Nora said, there's always information sessions and informal dinners in the evening, and I would encourage uh, applicants to go to those, even though they're technically optional, because it gives you a chance to, you know, ask your questions in a more um, informal setting and just get to meet the other applicants and students and see if it, um, you, you can get a sense of what the student culture is like just by chatting with current students. So that's actually quite helpful. Um, and I think in terms of logistics, I might add that um, regarding the, um, the information you actually receive about your interview schedule, uh, most schools will give you your schedule with all of your interviews and um, all of your faculty members, uh, maybe three to four days in advance, you know, sometimes closer, uh, at least a day or two. So you have the, the chance to um, like do the background research, like I mentioned. So um, there is time to do that as well if you, you know, find it helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's a good thing to point out too, that the schedules for every school should be given in advance. So that mm -hmm. should help you with preparation and with nerves. Um, Kira and Alan, I'm curious if you guys have anything to add about um, just about the structure of the day, the logistics of the day and what, what you expected. I think that they covered it pretty thoroughly. Mm -hmm. I will say one thing is that I had a couple of schools that didn't tell me my interviewers in advance. 
mm-hmm. and not to feel freaked out or panicked because you don't know what they do. Obviously, they know that you don't know what they do because they also are aware that you just got your interview schedule. So mm-hmm. I, I I think it freaked me out because it was definitely like in contrast to how I was preparing for my other interviews. Um, but if they're giving you your interview schedule like the morning of or the day before, they often won't expect you to have done a significant amount of research into sort of the backgrounds of the people who are interviewing you. So, absolutely. Alan, anything to add? Not particularly. Uh, they, they did a really great job. It, it's a whirlwind that'll go by very quickly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think as well, um, and you probably have seen on your end, but but interviews can be closed book or open book. So you might go into a a Zoom room and the person might know nothing about you. So keeping that in mind, I think was helpful because um, I would have some occasionally, and usually the, my interviewers would let me know if they knew nothing about me, um, but that can help you tailor so that you'll you'll save some time if it is an open book interview so that you're not just feeling like you're regurgitating your entire um, personal statement again for someone. Um, since we did touch on a little bit on that there's oftentimes both MD and MD-PhD days. I'm curious to hear, and Kira, we can start with you. Um, was there any difference in how you prepared for the MD-only side of the interviews versus the MD-PhD ones? Yeah, I mean, I think that the main difference for me is that for my PhD-only um, interviews, I was spending a lot more time looking at the research of the people who were interviewing me. So being prepared to talk their science as well as talk my science. Mm -hmm. Um, I think also just generally the MD interviews tend to be like the more touchy feely kind of questions. So um, be prepared for it to not be like a hard and fast science interview because that's typically not what they are. Um, And then for your PhD one, making sure that you're really familiar with your research, like you should know that like in and out. Um, Mm -hmm. You're familiar with your papers and Um, you're just like generally familiar with your science because they will ask you questions about your work. Um, And like, like Alan was saying, they'll ask you follow-up questions like what would you do as a next experiment or how would you verify that your past experiments were valid or whatever. So be prepared to do the more um, like emotionally uh, charged portion in the MD interviews. And then for your PhD portions, be prepared to talk hard science because that was typically my experience. I think that's a really great point to, if it's, if it's on your application, like be prepared to talk about it from a research end. Um, I know from like personal experience, like if it is on your, your resume or in your application in some way, you should feel comfortable talking about it. Um, I don't think any of the interviewers are looking for you to have a PhD level knowledge on any of the research that you've done. But um, one of the biggest things about this process is it's a long one. So enthusiasm and sincerity and engagement go a really long way. So if you can show that, you know, maybe all you did was not all, but maybe you you just did did once like Eliza's over and over for one little thing and you don't feel like you had much of a role. But if you um, have a good handle on a knowledge of what you were doing, um, you can really shine that way. Uh, Kira, I was just curious when you're talking about the difference between um, since you had like the MD and the PhD side of your interviews, did you notice any difference in kind of what the interviewers were looking for? Um, in the questions they asked or how they were kind of hoping you would respond? Okay, I, I was thinking about this actually earlier. Honestly, I tried not to think about what they wanted me to say. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, like Alan was saying, I tried to directly answer their questions, but a big part of this is figuring out if you're a good fit for their program as well. So I tried really hard not like to answer these questions as me as much as I possibly could because even if they decided I was not a good fit for their program that was also saving me from being in a program that I was not a good fit for so yeah I mean I think that in like the more specific uh way I think that like MDs are looking typically for like experiences in the hospital and like clinical experiences experiences with patients And like PhDs are looking for experiences in the lab generally, but like more broadly, I think trying to stray away from like, what should I be answering this question with? And instead thinking like, I'm going to answer this question as myself as much as possible. Well, like I said, still actually answering the question that was asked. 
Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, especially it, it, it can be tough to kind of guess at what they're looking for. And I think just being able to let yourself shine through a little more um, and, and showing that sincerity can, can really make you stand out on interview day. Uh, I want to remind everyone just again, if you want to add any questions to the Q&A uh, portion of this, feel free to include them in the chat box. Um, and then just a reminder that uh, the sessions, this session will be recorded, so you can feel free to access it at a later date if you've got to step away for any moment. Um, I wanted to ask about, just because I, I was seeing it pop up quite a bit, um, when you get, especially on the MD side, because I noticed this on my end, um, how to answer those tough questions about um, problems like, I, I got questions about the biggest problems facing the healthcare industry. Um, I remember I got one question that was something like, if you could change one thing in the world, what would you change? And it was just, just these really hard questions, especially those that are specific to either healthcare or something policy related that maybe you don't have. Um, you may not feel you have as, uh, like as much of a say on. Um, so I'm curious to hear how you all approach those questions. And Nora, let me start with you. Yeah, um, I think those were definitely some of the toughest questions that that I faced also. Um, I think some advice that I got, and I think we brought this up a while ago, is like sticking to stories. You know, you as an MD, PhD applicant are not going to have like a wealth of information about healthcare policy and how to fix things. Um, so when I would get questions like that, I would try to, you know, think of a story of a problem that I saw in a clinical experience and sort of tell that story and sort of tie it to like a problem th that I saw in healthcare and, you know, maybe some ideas from my own experience of how to fix it. Um, I think, you know, that they're trying to get to know you. And I think the, some of the best ways to, um, to have that happen is by telling stories. So instead of, you know, speaking abstractly, maybe about those large problems, trying to be concrete in the experiences that, um, that you've had. Um, and then some of those other questions that are more, um, also, I guess, soft, like one that I got was what, what keeps you up at night, which is never a question that I thought I was going to answer in an in MD PhD interview. You know, you're just, you are going to get these really like off the wall questions that you can't expect. Um, and so, yeah, I think just, you know, speaking sincerely, trying to tie it to a story. So you're not just rambling on about things that are, um, yeah, that, that you don't have a concrete answer to. So yeah, trying to think of stories that you, you might tell in those, in those, to answer those questions was how I approach them at least. I really love that point on stories because I, I just think it, it lets your sincerity show through a lot more. Um, and then also since we're looking to go into healthcare, uh, like a lot of these stories, it, it's about a person you encountered, a patient you encountered, someone you met with. And I think being able to show um, kind of that personal connection I think is really important. So I really like that point. Um, I do want to ask as well, kind of just because this was brought up, um, how would you approach any like sensitive topics related to like current laws, abortion laws or anything like that? Was there anything you found as far as those type of questions that um, you found challenging to navigate? I don't know if I ever actually got asked anything about policy, um, but I think how I would approach it was also just probably to be honest about my opinions about it. I don't think that there's a need to like pretend that you don't have an opinion on something. And even mm -hmm. if your opinion on something is different than the person who is interviewing you, hopefully that, you know, you're both civil people to agree that you disagree. And um, yeah, like explaining why you, you feel the way that you do about a particular law. And if you don't know a lot about it, also being honest about that, saying that, you know, I actually, I don't know that much about this, but this is what I think and why. And um, I think is how I would approach it. But I don't actually think that I ever got asked anything like that. Yeah, I remember a few in my MMIs and I remember being thankful that it was like, oh good, I've got five minutes to answer this. So the conversation's gonna end. Um, Kira, I see you nod in your head too. I'm wondering if you have anything to add to, um, especially those these kind of more charged questions, either ones that are healthcare policy related um, or related to specific laws and how you approach those? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these questions are just trying to make sure that you are thinking about this kind of stuff and also to see how you're thinking about policy, how you're thinking about healthcare, how you're thinking about like change. Um, so I think one of the things that I would say is like putting your thought process out there, like not just having like a hard and fast this is my thought on it period like end of statement 
but rather saying like this is my thought here's how I got to that thought here are some of like the nuances that I see to this and like here is like sort of like the way that I got to my position that I have um because I think that they really are just trying to see how you're approaching big problems Mm -hmm. and how you're thinking about um like the system as a whole so letting them see how you're processing these things rather than just giving a solid declarative statement I think is my biggest piece of advice Mm -hmm. I think that's a really great point because I think when we get asked these questions we might be thinking maybe there's a right or a wrong answer um and and for a lot of these there isn't that's why they're challenging problems and challenging questions. So, so being just showing that you're kind of engaged in what's currently going on in the world and that you have some awareness and that you're thinking through this. I think that's a really great point. Luke, do you have anything to add to that as well? Just about whether you got any questions like this during the interview trail? Honestly, I think Nora and Kira covered, um, covered it pretty well. I mean, you just have to, it's, it's overwhelming and kind of stressful to be asked these questions in the heat of the moment. But then when you step back, you can sort of ask yourself, okay, why are they asking me this question? Do they expect me to have some brilliant answer of how to fix like the US healthcare system in Mm -hmm. a few sentences? Probably not. Um, But they want to see that you've actually like thought about it, maybe that you're informed of, you know, how the healthcare system works, for example, and you're aware of what's going on in the world. And I think that goes a long way. Um, And then yeah, beyond that, they're really just trying to understand how you think and how you can arrive at um, potential solutions to certain problems. So like Kira said, they're just trying to understand your thought process. So as long as you're, um, as long as you do a good job of communicating that thought process, I think that um, is the answer in itself. Absolutely. Um, And Alan, I'm wondering if you kind of, maybe if you've seen any students grapple with these questions, kind of what, what you've seen is successful or what you're really looking for. Yeah, so I don't want to mislead anyone because I, in the sense that I'm not interviewing you, so I can't speak for for everyone else. Absolutely. Um, I I think what what Kira said as well is is really good in that. I think both. My my main themes would be it's okay to say I don't know, and it's okay to disagree. You are interviewing them, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so I'm not trying to diminish or make some grand confrontational stand about my own opinions, but I think it's okay to say, hey. You know, I might have my own opinions very strongly, but also for some people being, maybe you're going to be a surgeon and you don't personally don't care about any of those things. You are going to deal with the science. You are going to deal with the medicine. You know, medicine is a very broad field. You have everything from palliative care to surgery and everything in between. So knowing at least for now, what that is for you is, is a sense and, and always, right? I think for those kind of questions, I think it actually comes to arrogance a little bit. Um, It's okay to say, I don't know, and that's why I'm Mm -hmm. here, and I want to learn more, and I want to learn from people that are smarter than me, and I'm excited to do that, Um, and I know a little bit, but but I'd rather someone say, I don't know, and I'm excited to learn, than try to make something up or just, you know, toe the party line of what they think is, you know, I guess associated with medical professionals of like, you know, liberal woke stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Um, I guess just transitioning a little bit because um, since we're all here on Zoom and since I'm I'm guessing most of the interviews will continue to be on Zoom this year, um, I'm curious for the logistics of how everyone prepared differently for Zoom type interviews. Um, I know my experience, I kind of liked the Zoom format because I could like go grab a snack and then come back in a little bit. Um, But yeah, just I guess your thoughts on on Zoom and how you approached preparing in that way. Um, Kira, let's start with you. Yeah, so I also liked the Zoom interview format. Um, For me, it was also nice because I could like keep my experiments going while I was like interviewing, which was very convenient. Um, uh, For me, like the main things I did, like I said, were practicing on Zoom. So making sure that like Monica was pointing out my connection is good, my lighting is good. Um, there's nothing like crazy in my background you don't want to be surprised when you log into your first interview zoom um, and you will be staring at like just yourself and one other person for a long period of time unless you minimize yourself which is also something that you want to be familiar with doing I see Nora is nodding Um, (laughs) so if you know that you like are going to distract yourself by looking at yourself also it's okay to minimize yourself um but yeah, I would say that the main thing is just practicing and making sure 
again, that you're not surprised by anything when you're walking into this like Zoom environment. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits actually also of Zoom is that you're not walking into like six different random offices in a building you've never been to before. Mm -hmm. You get to take all of these from the comfort of your own home where you can control like all of the variables. So control the variables as much or as little as you want to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a really great point and, and hopefully should quell some of the nerves of folks that are, are with us tonight that you can control the environment and you know exactly what this is gonna look like. Um, in a lot of aspects. Um, Nora, Luke, since this process was so recent for you both as well, and I'm sure you went through mostly Zoom interviews, is there anything about how you prepared for the logistics of it that that really stand out? Um, yeah, I think what, what Kira said pretty much covered it. I'm also going to emphasize again that you are able to hide the view of yourself. This is kind of a game changer for me <laughs> um, because I felt like I was often distracted by like watching myself answer questions. So if you hit the three little dots next to your picture, you can say hide self view. So I would just do that when I got into an interview room with someone. And then it just feels much more like a natural conversation because normally when you're talking to people, you're not also getting the feedback of seeing yourself talking to people. Um, and I think I read that that is like one of the reasons they think that Zoom fatigue is a thing because you're, you're having like so much more cognitive input of watching yourself talk. Um, which I think that that was the other thing I was going to bring up is that it's days on Zoom are really long and it's really exhausting. So making sure that when you do have breaks, like getting away from the screen, you know, just um, taking a break because it the MD PhD interviews are really long days staring at a screen. Um, mm -hmm. So anything that you can do to um, less than that is useful. And then I think also, yeah, just just practicing on Zoom and, and knowing what the format is and all of the little things. Um, and then, oh, and the last thing I'll say is that things also go wrong technologically and it's not the end of the world. I remember the first time, like the, all the Wi-Fi in uh, my house cut out and it, I, I didn't have, I think it, I ended up doing like a phone call interview and I was, mm -hmm. you know, thought it was kind of the end of the world and it's not at all. You know, people know that these things happen and, you know, you just, you move on and, and make do. Um, so those are my, those are my Zoom tips, yeah, <laughs> but absolutely. I also think it's nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think those are great points. And I think um, during most of the interviews, you guys will find someone's going to give you like a phone number in case there's an emergency, um, in case you have like zero Wi-Fi and nothing's working. But but issues happen and admins understand that issues happen. Um, I think on a lot of my interviews, there were a little logistical issues or like a Zoom would cut out and they'll work with you. Um, and that shouldn't, at least at any institution, Worth its, worth its salt should not um, penalize you for that at all. So keep in mind that like things will freeze and things will happen. And that's just kind of the Zoom life we live. Um, Luke, do you have anything to add about how you prepared? Um, not too much. I, I will say, and this is maybe a little bit uh, inside baseball. So you can sort of use the, the virtual platform to your advantage in some ways. Um, so what I did, and I don't know if other people did this, and sorry about the lights, but you can actually have, um, you can have the Zoom screen at the top of your screen, and then you can have like your notes and questions at the bottom. Oh. So like I was saying earlier, um, a lot of interviews, you'll have the chance to ask, um, ask questions of your interviewers about the school, about the research, whatever. So you can just have those questions already prepared and right in front of you in case you forget. So that helps, you know, ease the conversation a little bit. Um, so that's one thing I did and found it to be pretty helpful. But yeah, um, Nora and Kira touched on, you know, all the other logistics that are um, pertinent to, to the virtual interviews. So I love all these little secret tips, having being able to fit the windows the way that works for you or, or I did not know the tip about hiding yourself. So thank you, Nora. I'm going to keep that. I might be on the strange other end of things where I actually like recorded myself on Zoom quite a bit practicing these questions because I was like worried I wasn't having enough eye contact or, you know, maybe I wasn't um, making sure like the camera and everything was at the right point. So past that point, I will like never watch those recordings again, as long as I live. But, but for those moments, it's really helpful just making sure that you're like actually looking in the right place. Um, Kira, did you want to add something as well? Yeah, I just wanted to add that non-technological things will go wrong too. And that's okay. Like there are mm -hmm. things that are going to happen. Like like Luke, your lights turning off and you just being like, oh yeah, sorry about the lights. Like that's <laughs> like a very normal thing to happen. 
when you're on zoom and you're like in your apartment I remember in one of my in one of my zooms my cat was like on my lap and I was like trying to like talk to this person that I'm having this like very professional interview with while my cat is like biting my hand so like people understand like they're also typically in their homes they know that like things are going to happen like you'll have people who are like sorry if you hear my kids running around or like dogs are barking in the background so everyone knows that this is not like the ideal environment you're at your house likely or you're at like a school or something like that so just like forgive yourself and like give yourself that that grace when things happen not if when because they will happen Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful point. Um, I think folks know to expect Zoom issues at this point. I can remember um, one of my interviews, like they started fixing the roof next to me and it was like the entire day with fixing the roof. And it started like at my first interview. So I went to the far corner of our house and like set my set some books on top of a bed and just like took the Zoom from the corner of the room as opposed to like my nice office that I planned for. Um, yeah, so try, trying your best, you know, whatever is going to create a quiet space where you're not um, so distracted. But, you know, I think everyone at this point understands that distractions are going to happen and we're going to try and work around it. Um, and I just want to remind if there's any other burning questions that that you want to make sure we touch on before we finish up for today, please feel free to throw them in the Q&A. Um, since we did talk quite a bit about um, kind of the questions you're going to get asked and that you're going to get why MD, PhD type questions, um, I kind of want to close out with just why you all chose this path. And um, since since for a lot of you, this this is like a more recent having to like communicate quite a bit about why you're here. Um, but let, let's start with you just about, about why MD, PhD and why not MD and why not PhD. Sorry, I hope this isn't giving anyone horrible flashbacks for <laughs> interviews, but. No, yeah, hopefully I've answered this question at this point. Um, so the answer I jokingly give is that I'm very indecisive. So doing both gives me plenty of options down the line. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the actual answer is um, that, well, I guess I'll, before I'll, I'll preface this by saying, I think a lot of people, they arrive on the MD PhD through, you know, different, uh, through different routes. I think some people are set on med school um, and going into medicine at first, and they realize they want to, you know, supplement that with uh, more uh, a research intensive training. And I think for me, I was the opposite. I was, you know, very fascinated by, um, you know, basic science research. And I thought that would be my sort of long-term career. But then I realized over time that I was actually much more interested in the translational aspects of what I was, you know, doing in the lab. And I think, you know, once I learned that doing both degrees was possible, I I realized it was the best fit for me. And I think um, it gives me doing both the the MD and the PhD in in a combined program gives me the training that is, you know, most amenable to what I hope to be doing, um, five to 10 years down the line. And I think um, ultimately that's that's what it was for me. And I think that's probably true of most other applicants, but I think um, really it was the, you know, translational aspects of, uh, of my research and the ability to, you know, implement what I'm doing in the lab into actual clinical care was, is what motivated me to, uh, to go into this. That's wonderful. And I think uh, like the sincerity really reads through in, in uh, how you speak about it. Uh, Nora, do you have anything anything to add about just why, you know, why you went through this long interview process and, and what it all meant to you? Yeah, um, I think I also joke that I'm a very indecisive person and just couldn't decide and this pushes the decision down the road. But um, in all seriousness, I think I didn't really know what I wanted to do at all going into college and sort of found both basic science research and like clinical patient care sort of separately. Um, And for a while felt like very torn between wanting to do like a basic science PhD and wanting to go to med school. So very different than Luke in that I, I I wasn't doing translational research. I was doing those two things entirely separately and yet finding so much value in both like the minutia of lab research and also sort of the the people focused like real life immediate impacts that you could have I worked as an EMT um so doing that um and then I found out at some point in college that an MD PhD was a thing because I didn't know that at all and it sort of seems like the the perfect path where I could do both of those things that I think are, are very different um but by crossing them over and by thinking in those like two very different ways um I think 
was is like very very valuable to how I imagined what I wanted a career to look like. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's how I ended up here, <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. And I, I really love your, your perspective on, on one informing the other and kind of getting to take, take the best of both and, and put that into a career. So hopefully that kind of inspires the applicants um, that are on the Zoom call tonight just a bit. Kira, how about you? Yeah, so I think that I feel like very similarly to a lot of the things that Luke and Nora said. Um, I think that one of the great things about having both of the degrees is that it gives you the flexibility to sort of approach translational research projects from whatever angle you want to. So whether that looks like primarily working with patients in the clinic and sort of gathering data and bringing it back to the bench, or whether that looks like driving your research from the bench and possibly just like interfacing with patients um, like intermittently, I think that it gives you the ability to do both of those things, which is something that is unique. And I think that it also helps you to sort of spend these eight years figuring out exactly how you want these two things to interface and like how you want that to play out in your own career. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that was really important to me about the MD PhD program specifically. Uh, I, you, I get asked a lot, you know, why are you not just doing an MD and like doing a bunch of research? Um, and I think that for me, that's like one of the big things is that the PhD training, I think, will hopefully allow me to like really understand how I do want to tackle the kinds of questions that I'm interested in. Um, and sort of like looping all the way back around, I think that the questions that I'm interested in are the reason that I decided MD PhD was the right path for me. Um, they sort of like fall like right at the intersection of clinical medicine and and bench science. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's one of the best best parts about this training is it teaches you how to ask the right questions and how to approach those questions. So um, I, I feel exactly the same about that. Um, Alan, and then I'm curious just for your perspective, especially seeing a bunch of like bright eyed and bushy tailed M1s on the Zoom that we're all very excited about and very ready to answer that question. So I'd, I'd love to hear kind of in the thick of the grad years, um, what it means to you to be a part of kind of be continuing on this process. Yeah, could I share a lesson I think I've learned? Uh, I'm not Absolutely. sure that Please I- Please do, yeah. We had um, part of our, we do, I don't know if it's becoming more common, but we do pretty much like early clinical exposure. So we have like primary care clerkships. And one of our ones we had to do was like a home visit where we had to do three different times with a particular patient from our primary care clerkship. And the woman was a nun. Um, and I remember asking her like, why'd you become a nun? You know, or how, how does that change? And not probably not gonna come as a shocker. I'm not a religious person, I, I have no idea. And she became a nun at 19, very erudite woman. And she said, you know, the reason you become a nun at 19 is not the reason you stay a nun at 40, is not the reason you stay a nun at 80. Um, and I think an MD, PhD, and, or any career like it, or any is very similar. Um, I think one part of it is you have an idea, but you don't really know. I mean, you, you'll start collecting stories from people you meet, but like our director did an MD, PhD, and then did a postdoc and never did residency. And one day was asked to be a director of a program. Um, I think your career will be dynamic and exciting, and you'll get to learn every day. And that's a beautiful thing. I think people have labs for 10 years, and then don't because it's too much to have a lab and see patients. Um, so th th that happens. Um, but I think the beautiful thing that I've learned more and more that everyone's touched upon is like, you're never gonna be the best clinician and you're never gonna be the best researcher necessarily because you, you just can't do both 100% um, of the time. But at the same time, I'm sitting in meetings with clinicians who like have pretty good questions, but they have no idea how to execute them. We're like, Okay, like you're not collecting the right data to ask that question. You don't actually know the right statistics. Like you're, that's not meaningful. Or then you have like, depending on your science or what field you're in, you have people that want to like have really interesting answers to questions, but nobody really cares. Like no one wants to ask them. They're not important. Like, okay, you came up with a really interesting mathematical concept, but like it's not helping anybody. So I think you find more and more your job will be that conduit where you get to like be, a, you know, a translator and hence translation for both those people. And maybe you're not doing all of the basic science, you're not seeing all the patients, but you have a fundamental grasp of both that you're able to communicate and um, you know, run a good team. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think that's all like really, really great points to hammer home with. 
um, especially I think one of the joys of, of kind of when I started being interested in MD PhD programs and then now getting to actually be in one is seeing what everyone does with it as they get out because um, it's just such a wide range. Um, so, so you might approach, approach the interview process and think you're really, really confident what, what it's going to look like at the other end. But like you said, with your own story, you just, you never know where this is going to lead you. And I think the joy of these programs is having the flexibility. Um, but then to your point as well, just having kind of the why, um, to carry you through all of this. And since it is such a long journey. Um, so I think I, I would encourage the applicants that are on here getting ready for their interviews, like really having some some why that they can really communicate in their interviews that makes clear to them, you know, why they're why they're signing up for eight years of a long, long process. Um, so I will close out with that to make sure we finish on time. Just some nice little, little um, hopefully some inspirational bits for all of you. I, I just want to go around if there's anything anyone else wants to add just about the interview process. Um, about anything that we didn't touch on tonight. Um, maybe I know we included a little bit about like how you adjusted your thinking as the interviews went on. Um, if there's anything anyone wants to include. I'll just say once again, just to, to be yourself and to, um, you know, like let your excitement about science and about, you know, embarking on an MD PhD program, like shine through. Um, Cause I think that, you know, the person who's interviewing you can, can definitely tell that you're excited about something and that comes through. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I do think it reads through on the Zooms as well. Like regardless, it it, it will read. So um, Luke, any any last last bits that you wanted to include before we close out? Yeah, I'll just add that um, I think this is really the most exciting and fun part of the whole application process. You know, you've, you've cleared so many hurdles just to get here. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of like the um, the final one to clear. So um, I would just say, you know, be excited about um, being invited to these interviews and, you know, be positive, even though it's, even though they're very long and draining sometimes, and this process will probably extend until February and you're not going to know where you're going to end up until maybe April or May. So there's still a long time to go, you know, be patient with it, um, but just take it all in stride and, you know, be happy um, if you are receiving interviews and, and make the most of them and enjoy those conversations. Um, Kira, if there's anything else you'd like to add, any last bits? Yeah, I mean, I think what Nora said is like really important to make sure that you're showing that you're excited. I think that with nerves, that can be like difficult to do. Um, so just trying to like take a deep breath and and mm -hmm. let your your personality show through. And then I think later on in the interview cycle, you can also feel like, oh, I've had this conversation like 45 times and now I'm having a hard time like still being excited about talking about the same thing that I've talked about a ton of times. And again, reminding yourself that like, this is what you're excited about. And, and like Alan was saying, or sorry, like Luke was saying, um, like this is a really exciting process and it's a really um, like big deal to be getting an interview in the first place and trying to like remind myself of that I think was helpful. Um, and also, I just wanted to say if anyone has any like other questions that they want to ask, like feel free to send me an email. Um, I know that they just sent the Google Doc in the chat, but I'm happy to answer. Oh, absolutely. That's a good point to include because we will. Um, so all the panelists here, their contact information should be on that bio link. Um, so feel free to reach out to them directly or reach out to us via the virtual content committee um, email if you have any additional questions. Um, Alan, anything you wanted to close off with as far as takeaways for interviewing? Um, yeah, no, it's all very beautiful sentiments. Um, cynically, you know, you'll never be this green again. So yeah, enjoy <laughs> it. Um, and, and make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. You know, again, mm -hmm. you'll you'll collect a lot of stories and, and not everyone finishes an MD PhD either. So just make sure you're, you know, doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. And I think doing it with sincerity and communicate, communicating that in sincerity above all else, um, really important. Um, so I just want to thank you all so much for joining us all today, um, taking the time out of your evening to join us, as well as thanks to all the students that are on our call. Um, so and then I also want to thank the APSA Virtual Content Committee, JETI, PR Partnerships Committees, Gabby, Stephen, and APSA Leadership, um, all the folks that put together these sessions and um, 
we are currently in the process of planning the calendar for the upcoming interactive sessions. We will have, um, like I said, that session on, on December 8th on gap years and post back programs. So stay tuned for that and keep an eye on the APSA webpage. So with that, I'll close out. Thank you everyone for your time this evening. <laughs>